As discussed in an earlier video, separation of powers cases tend to be decided on the basis of first principles. The courts will be reasoning from general standards and not detailed legal tests. As a way of organizing these standards, the Kickstarter builds on the various methods of reasoning that are often seen in constitutional litigation. If there are no cases on point, the primary focus tends to be on arguments from text and structure. So let's start with some text arguments. Imagine we must decide whether the Supreme Court can impeach the Attorney General and remove her from office. Pause the video to formulate your own answer. In this case, the text of the Constitution answers the question quite clearly. The House of Representatives has the sole power to impeach a federal officer, and the Senate has the sole power to hold the impeachment trial. By contrast, there's no language at all in Article 3 that could be construed to give this power to the judiciary. So congratulations, the text has definitively answered our separation of powers question. Now let's imagine that some very popular person is convicted of a federal crime. Congress, responding to political pressure, wants to pardon that person. Pause the video and decide this question. Can Congress pardon someone? In this example, we don't have the comfort of the words sole power. Nonetheless, the text seems to indicate pretty clearly that the legislative branch cannot issue pardons, and only the president can. We can tell this because pardons are listed as a presidential power, and they are not listed as a congressional power. So Congress can't issue its own pardons, but could it pass a law regulating how the president issues pardons? In this example, we can imagine a law saying that convictions for counterfeiting can never be pardoned. Now, how could this go into effect? Presumably the president would veto this law, but let's assume that Congress has overridden the veto. Pause the video for a moment. Formulate your own separation of powers arguments. At the textual level, this question is a bit harder than the last one because there's actually some constitutional language for Congress to rely on. First, Congress has an enumerated power to determine the punishment for counterfeiting, and maybe that includes a punishment that could consist of a term of imprisonment with no possibility of a pardon. Second, Congress has what we call the power of the purse. Congress will often exert some control over executive branch officials by appropriating funds with conditions attached. For example, some past budget bills appropriated money for the U.S. Justice Department, but specified that none of the funds could be used for federal prosecutions of people who were using medical marijuana in conformity with state law. In our example, the president probably doesn't need to spend much money to pardon a counterfeiter, but in general, the power of the purse is an extremely important limitation on the executive branch. Third, the Necessary and Proper Clause allows Congress to make laws for carrying out the powers vested by this Constitution in any officer of the United States. So the pardon power is vested by the Constitution in the President, and the President is an officer of the United States. So this suggests Congress could pass laws regulating how the pardon power will be carried out. It should come as no big surprise that Congress has considerable authority over the executive branch. In the American system, the branches of government have some independence from each other, but it's not total independence. The separation of the branches is intentionally incomplete, leading to areas of overlap and concurrent power. In these overlapping areas of influence, branches can check and balance each other. There's lots of potential for interbranch disagreement and conflict. As I mentioned before, most executive versus legislative branch conflicts get worked out politically, one way or another. But sometimes a court needs to issue a decision. Imagine the president pardons some counterfeiter, despite Congress's law. 
If not released from custody, the counterfeiter would file suit to obtain freedom or to obtain other benefits of a pardon after release. The court has no choice but to decide the matter. And as we've seen, the text doesn't completely resolve this question. So we have to come up with other tools. Because separation of powers is a structural concept, the next logical place to look is structure arguments. One structural question is whether a branch is acting outside its proper sphere. This sort of arrogation of power is most obvious when a branch acts without any plausible claim for text support. Pause the video for a moment. Construct an arrogation of power argument regarding our counterfeiting statute. In my view, it's frankly debatable whether Congress is arrogating too much power to itself. After all, it does have its textual arguments to say that this is within its power. However, one way of viewing this problem is to say that Congress is claiming for itself a power over pardons that it doesn't really possess. Even if a branch is working from a usually authorized source of power, it might have acted in a way that interferes with the intended workings of another branch. Pause the video here to construct an interference argument on our counterfeiting statute. Here, there's a strong argument that the statute forbidding pardons to counterfeiters unduly interferes with the president's ability to decide when to issue pardons. Indeed, if a law like this were upheld, it would mean that Congress could essentially prevent the president from ever issuing any pardons whatsoever. This would be a great interference with the president's pardon power. Another structural argument can ask which branch is in a better position to make the best decisions in these kinds of cases. This structural argument is usually not used on its own, but it can be helpful as a way of supporting other arguments. Pause the video for a moment and think about which branch of government has greater competence to decide pardoning questions. There are good reasons to think that presidents are in a better position to make pardoning decisions. After all, the executive branch is in charge of criminal prosecution, and it also operates the federal prison system. It will have the best information about the person seeking the pardon, and it will also have the best information about how a pardon might affect the federal criminal justice system as a whole. By contrast, the primary job of a legislature is to establish general laws that apply to everyone. Legislatures debate policies, and they generally don't debate the merits of a single person's case. That makes a legislature a less than ideal body for deciding pardons. Arguments from text and structure tend to get the most attention in separation of powers cases, but it can also be relevant to consider other methods of reasoning. If there are cases on point, of course, a court will pay attention to that precedent. Non-judicial history can also be very relevant, since there are often no cases on point. Here, in England, pardons were acts of mercy from the king and not from parliament. The American presidency is the logical inheritor of this royal privilege. In the 50 states, pardons are typically handled by governors, with little to no interference from state legislatures. Over the centuries, presidents have issued pardons for a huge variety of convictions, and these decisions have typically involved the defendant's degree of rehabilitation or hardship. And presidents have felt free to grant pardons regardless of which offense the defendant was convicted on. Finally, Congress has never enacted a statute like the one in our example. This could be a hint that past Congresses have assumed that it was unconstitutional. Although that's not necessarily true, maybe they just thought it was a bad idea, but a constitutional one. On the whole, though, history seems to cut against this law. Next, consequences can be considered. When thinking about consequences, we can look not only at the immediate result for the parties in this dispute, but the consequences for similarly situated parties, and perhaps most important, the consequences for governmental structure. 
Here, upholding the congressional ban on pardons for counterfeiters would have potentially bad consequences for this counterfeiter and potentially other counterfeiters. But the bigger consequence is for the president's pardon power. Finally, as always, we can consult national values. Now, these should not simply be the values that one particular judge happens to hold. We want values that we can see in the Constitution's text, in the nation's history, in court precedents, or other sources. Here, the existence of a pardon power indicates that mercy and an opportunity for people to get second chances after committing a crime seems to be an important value. And that's not just one judge that thinks so. It's built into the Constitution's recognition of the pardon power and our history with it. To the extent this new statute conflicts with these values, that can be an additional reason for finding it unconstitutional as a violation of separation of powers.